Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs. Gordon Raquel from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create film courses for professionals to deepen and diversify their existing skill set. You can learn more at FilmmakerU.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at Filmmaker underscore U. Every week, we interview film professionals to discuss their work, and this week, I'm joined by director-producer Jay Holden, whose work includes uh, Before the Dawn, Strange Events, and Cam Girls. Welcome to the show, Jay. Thank you, Gordon. It's nice to be here. Now, um, I want to know, how did you get into directing and producing? Like, What was your route in? I know a lot of people want to be directors and producers, so how, how did you, how'd you break in? Uh, I, you know, I, I saw Star Wars uh, at five years old and decided I wanted to make movies. Walked out of the theater with my parents and said, I want to be a movie director. They treated me the same way that parents treat all precocious children. Like, yeah, that's great, kid. And I've spent the rest of my life following that same goal. Um, I, I was really fortunate to get into theater early uh, in, in Arizona and kind of work in that world first before I moved to Hollywood and start working uh, behind the scenes. But I, I also sort of recognized very early as a wannabe director that I needed to understand what everybody else was doing on the set. So I started trying every other job. And that's kind of what my breaking into the business was. I started as an actor professionally and moved behind the scenes. I did pretty much everything in theater all the way up to stage management. Then when I moved into film, I started as an electrician and then started sort of working my way up. And I discovered that I was uh, an actually a pretty good producer. And I was able to produce projects for me to shoot, which is how I built my cinematographer's reel, which is how I became P. And then I kind of continued producing and that led to a lot of opportunities as a director as well. So what do you look for in scripts when you're, uh, when you're trying to find your next script or idea if you're gonna write it yourself? I always look for something that I wanna see. So when I'm reading that script, if this is a movie that I wanna see and I'm excited about, then I'm interested. If it's a, yeah, whatever, or, you know, this is not my genre that I, I usually put it aside, but if it excites me and I, as a moviegoer, want to go see the movie, then that's one of the first barometers for me. It also, it has to have heart. It has to have some sort of meaning or satisfaction to it, whether the good guys or the bad guys win either way. Uh, those are the kind of things that I look for. Is there... Um... Is there particular things that excite you about films? Like, is there a particular genre or style that you like to, to work in? I'm really drawn to thriller and suspense. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to say horror until I, I did a web series about horror films and realized that, no, classic horror, I'm not really into. I'm not into the whole blood and guts. I'm really much more into the thriller and suspense aspect. But I, anything that tells a, a story and moves an audience and, and leaves something with an audience. Uh, Terry Gilliam did a, a, a talk years ago, and he talked about the ability of the filmmaker to kind of throw a bomb into the audience and explode. And there would be shrapnel thrown around. Mm -hmm. And that shrapnel embedded in the audience is what they leave with and is always with them. And that's kind of something that I'm always thinking about in every project is what is that little piece that I can leave with the audience that they'll be thinking about for a day or a week or a month or, or the rest of their lives. And that's what I strive for. Whether I achieve it or not, it's a whole other story, but that's what I try for. So what are, you know, because I'm always fascinated with suspense in the sense of like that, the emotional relationship between the audience and the filmmakers, so, uh, like in building that suspense for them. How in the stories or in your filmmaking process, um, what are some techniques or ideas you've discovered to help sort of ramp up that suspense for people or create that feeling of suspense? Play on expectations for the first thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, one of the classic things is the mirror shot in the bathroom, right? Mm -hmm. uh, somebody opens the medicine cabinet, they close it, you see somebody behind them. We know these tropes and these cliches. So if you play on that and you don't give people what they expect, then there's sort of a, a constant feeling of anxiety waiting for when you're finally gonna hit them with something, right? So you build mood, you build ambiance, and you subvert expectations as much as possible 
uh, playing on cliches and tropes and, and what trying to be ahead of your audience. Uh, I, I don't ever, I don't ever want to uh, condescend to an audience. I want them to be, feel like they're ahead of me, but I always need to be two or three steps ahead of them. That's what makes a successful story. Now, you, you also wrote a, uh, the Cine Lens Manual. Can you tell us about that? What, what was your uh, motivation behind creating that book? What, tell us about that. So I, I was a cinematographer for about 10 years, and I found a, a secondary passion to directing and cinematography, and I have stayed very involved in that world uh, for a very long time. I'm a technical editor for American Cinematographer Magazine. I'm a member, uh, associate member of the ASC. Uh, I teach cinematography. I've written two other books about it. Um, and this was, this was really just seeing that there was a big gap in the education market, a lot of misinformation, um, and a lot of hard information to find. And after really, after 10 years of shooting as a DP, coming to find that I knew nothing about lenses uh, was a real eye-opener for me. I spent my whole career with very limited information and I started diving really deep into learning more so that I could start teaching a little bit more. And that led to the idea of there's a vacuum of this information. Uh, so I got together with a very good friend of mine, Christopher Probst to ASC. And I said, do you want to do a book? And he was like, sure. <laughs> really having no idea what it was going to take. And even I was like, well, you know, it could be a year or two that we put this together. Then it took us eight years um, and it just came out and, and I'm, I'm very proud of it. I'm very, uh, all Huber aside, it is the definitive uh, resource for cinema optics, which there's very little information about. Mm -hmm. So what was some of the misinformation? Cause you said there was misinformation out there. Oh man. It Anything that got a good laugh from you, or is it all like an unsettling misinformation? Uh, there, there was so much that we discovered, even uh, correcting manufacturers in their own information. There was a, a particular lens series uh, that a manufacturer said came out in one particular year. And we found out that the optical designer didn't even start working with that company until three years later. And the patent was filed four years later. Yeah. Like, it, this isn't possible. Um, that's a small thing. The bigger things were depth of field. I mean, I spent almost a year uh, as a side project just working to understand depth of field and erase what had been taught, all the indoctrination that I had gotten from other textbooks. Uh, it doesn't behave the way that people think it does. And there's a lot of misunderstandings about it. Uh, that and um, larger format sensors and what benefit those give. And that relates back to depth of field. One of the things uh, that filmmakers did, especially as digital cinematography started to rise, was to try to limit depth of field by using longer lenses further away. Hmm. But the truth is that focal distance has more influence over depth of field than focal length does. So if you take a 50 millimeter lens from five feet and a hundred millimeter lens from 10 feet, they have exactly the same depth of field. And that's kind of a, that was a real mind blowing uh, aspect to try to make sure that people understood, uh, to talk about circled confusion and, and eliminate a lot of the misnomers from that. They're in every calculator. Uh, there, there, there was a lot yeah. that, that we covered. How the heck did you research this if there was so little on it? Like that was one of the things you said is that it was, you know, a lack of, <laughs> resource so uh, it was diving very deep i mean i i my whole library has been revamped uh, with optics here uh, it's reading white papers reading hundreds of patents talking to optical designers talking to optomechanical designers uh, talking to lens manufacturers spending time doing test after test after test uh, to verify the information breaking lenses down and rebuilding them uh, really coming to have a deep intimate understanding of the subject and it took deep dive uh you know even getting into going to a lens manufacturer into their archives and and looking through their sales receipts to verify dates uh it was just an extraordinary amount of research which is part of why it took us eight years instead of one or two now is there a particular old 
lens that you you really like or is is are all of them your favorites <laughs> like kids <laughs> they, they really are all my favorites yeah. uh there's there's no good lens or bad lens every lens has a job and every lens has a, a story to tell mm -hmm. uh and there's been a wonderful resurgence of vintage lenses mm -hmm. 60 70 80 even 100 years old uh, that were previously kind of discarded, but are now being rediscovered for their faults. And those faults add a certain character to the image and help tell a story. So I find that really exciting uh, to have these older lenses come back, get put into new mechanical housings and see an entirely new life. Uh, I don't have any particular favorite, whatever tells us the story and does the job. Now, you've had many different roles in the industry. Um, how do you deal with the ups and downs of the industry and uh, things like imposter syndrome and, and the worry that you're not in the right spot, I guess, in the career? You know, it, the ups and downs are, are, are extraordinarily difficult. And, and I thank you for asking that question because I don't think enough people talk about it. Uh, we all deal, especially as freelancers, we deal with a lot of droughts. We deal with uh, a lot of rejection doesn't happen very often. It's a lot more hollow acceptance. Like, oh, you're amazing. You're fantastic. We're going to work together. We're going to do the next project. And then you never hear from them again. Uh, I found one of the best ways to deal with those droughts is learning, mm -hmm. is always trying to expand my knowledge base, always trying to uh, test something new or try a new piece of equipment or read about a new technique. Uh, to kind of keep those muscles working during the downtime. And that also includes watching a lot of films. Uh, I've made that part of my job. Uh, and for the most part, average about 300 you know, film or TV episodes a year uh, to continue to watch what's out there, to learn from them, good and bad, uh, and stay energized as much as possible. Um, Imposter syndrome is, is impossible to get past. Yeah. Um, and it's a, one of the things that really kind of sunk it in with me that, okay, this is just a thing, was an interview with Steven Spielberg mm -hmm. talking about today, every first day on set, he gets on set and thinks, I don't know what I'm doing. And everybody's going to figure out that I don't know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And to hear somebody so extraordinarily accomplished with such an incredible body of work to talk about the same feeling that I have on day one was really reassuring. Like, okay, this is just a natural part of the creative process mm -hmm. that we're sort of always feel like we're faking it a little bit um, and just kind of embrace that as, okay, that's a nature of the beast. Now, is, you know, you've, you've been directing and producing your, your films. Um, is there a particular one that was particularly difficult for you to produce or get the funding for? And, and what, what was that? And how did you overcome that? They all are. <laughs> <laughs> There's, especially in today's marketplace, um, independent financing is extraordinarily difficult to get. Uh, because we have uh, eliminated, for the most part, physical media, mm -hmm. uh, the recoup for an investor is a, is a lot harder. When you're talking about um, major streaming platforms that are paying six cents per hour of viewing, uh, recouping an investment is extraordinarily difficult, even for a successful small film. So it's, it's a challenge and, and really... Mm -hmm. I've talked to a lot of investors about the idea of you're investing in creating something, in creating a piece of art that you're proud of. You're not necessarily making a financial investment. You have to be willing to lose that entire investment. Uh, and that's a difficult thing because most people who are investing want to make money back, right? It's a business. We want to make money. But unfortunately, in the independent world, it's becoming harder and harder and harder to do. There's a bigger gap between major studio tentpole productions that are you know, $300 million and raking in a billion and tiny little sub $1 million films that are you know, getting that Netflix or Amazon or, or 
uh, to be released. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's it's difficult. For the most part, my films have been uh, financed by um, independent angel investors. Uh, and it's just going out and finding those individuals who really want to experiment and play in, uh, in making movies. How the heck, because if it's six cents an hour, like in, in some cases, like how do you guys even recoup the cost then? It's like such a difficult, like, industry. <laughs> like, I know that it's like a huge, you know, problem, but how do you, like, like I've never heard that, that it was six cents an hour. It's amazing. Uh, it, it's uh, it's painful, uh, and it really comes down to marketing and advertising and trying to get the word of mouth out uh, about a project. And, and that's what a lot of filmmakers don't realize is that the real business aspects. You know, everybody's like, "I'm going to make my movie, and then I'm going to put it out in the world, and it'll get discovered." No, the real business aspect is the constant push, advertising, marketing, following up, uh, finding the right distributor. Uh, and really fostering that film out in the marketplace. So um, co-producer, uh, writer, and star of Before the Dawn, uh, mm -hmm. she is just constantly on social media, uh, working to promote the film, uh, sharing other people, posting about it, and trying to spread the word. And you know, we have millions of views, but those equate to tens of thousands of dollars as opposed to millions of dollars. Yes. It's, it's not the same as box office. That's fascinating. Um, so now when you're, when you're directing, because you've acted, you said, so you have that experience as an actor. So how do you approach working with actors then to get the particular emotions out of them that you want or the particular performance out of them that you want? I got a piece of advice from a director many, many years ago when I was an actor uh, that I carry with me every day. And that is, it's a little blunt, but uh, there are three different types of actors. There's the type of actor that you have to baby and hold their hands and, and walk them through and coddle a little bit. There's the type of actor that you have to be hands off and, and just leave alone. And then there's the type of actor that you have to kick in the ass and you have to push them. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's your job as a director to know who's who and how to treat each individual and what they need. My training uh, as an actor allows me to speak to them in their language, whether that's you know, a method or, or Meisner or Stanislavski or, or whatever process that they're utilizing, sense memory, uh, whatever gets them there to understand that individual actor and to work with them within their language and their system to get to where I need them to be. Uh, I think um, there's a great book by Judith Weston on um, directing actors that talks about never giving actors a result-oriented direction. You don't ever tell somebody you're angry because if you tell them that, then they're analyzing what does it mean to be angry? What do I do? I'm gonna make an angry face. Instead, you give them an action verb and you say, I want you to punish the other actor. And that gives them something to just focus on and, and be active with and be much more organic in their performance. So it's little tools like that and understanding how actors work. Interesting. Now I have one last question for you. You know, we've been stuck in this pandemic for going on three years now. <laughs> um, in that time, you know, depending on where we are in, in the pandemic, you might be in a particular wave or have to stay home for various reasons. And a lot of people turn to streaming services. Um, is there a show or a movie you've discovered over the last year that you think people should check out? I'm mildly embarrassed about this, but I probably shouldn't be. But I found during this pandemic, um, I wanted to go to a comfort zone. Uh, and I started really diving deep into uh, TV shows and movies from my childhood. Mm -hmm. So part of it was, was research and it's kind of how it started. But then my wife and I binge watched the, the entire uh, series of Little House on the Prairie. And then I went back and watched Buck Rogers and, and yeah. Battlestar Galactica and these things that I grew up with as a kid that I felt really just comfortable kind of sitting in that world and kind of enjoying the nostalgia of it. Uh, there's so many great shows um, that are streaming right now. It's, it's hard to pick any particular one. 
yeah, that, that's kind of what I did during the, the pandemic was to go back to things that I loved that were comfortable. I, I completely agree. I watched, I rewatched MASH. <laughs> nice. That's a great idea. Yeah. I will thank you so much for letting me interview you today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Jordan, I appreciate it. And thank you for what you guys do at Filmic Radio. Thank you. And that's it for this week, everyone. Uh, make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com or of course on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. I'm your host, Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching. Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs.